What is going on, you guys? Welcome back to the channel. Hope you're having a great day, morning, noon, night, whatever it is for you guys. Hope you're having the best day possible. So we're going to be hopping right back on into some more Luton 09's The Emperor of Man. This is part two. Are y'all ready? Let's get into it. Bum, 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 bum. The grim darkness of the future. There is only war. The 31st millennium of man would be one of the darkest and most destructive humanity had faced. It would bring the newly established Imperium to its knees and deal wounds so severe it would never truly recover. I need to say that this section of Imperial law is vastly complex and heavily documented. Bearing that in mind, I'll be covering it in a briefer fashion as specific events can be looked at later in time. However, the 31st millennium is one of the most important periods as it deals with the fall of humanity as a truly dominant power and the inception of the Imperium that would exist into the 41st millennium. The Heresy The Horus Heresy. This was essentially a mutiny by several Primarchs and their Space Marine legions, a betrayal against the Emperor and the Imperium instigated by the War Master Horus Lupercal. Now considering how much is written about these events, it actually takes place over a very short time scale in the general scheme of events in 40k, lasting for only about 7 years. As I already outlined, this rebellion ultimately was orchestrated by, at this time, the unknown forces of chaos. Yet there were many secondary factors and arguably, even without the influence of chaos, it seems possible that these events could have taken place without dark suggestions from the warp, albeit likely to a lesser extent. The Emperor's return to Terra to establish new projects that for whatever reason he was unwilling to also share with even Horus or any of the Primarchs left them feeling set aside and cast out from his circle of trust. This would lead to feelings of resent or in some outright anger and disgust. This was less though about ego or pride than it was trust, although there is no doubt these emotions were an element in play. Primarchs, despite their demigodlike stature and ability, were fundamentally human at the core. It was more about their deep connection to the Emperor, and perhaps that they saw themselves not as equal, but at least on a similar level to him. His retreat yeah. to Earth and abandonment of them at this juncture certainly left them feeling consigned to the rest of humanity. These feelings were surely yeah, just like the rest of, us, of doubt, not an outright stab to the heart, but nonetheless 
the seeds of mistrust were sown, and those chinks in the armour of the Imperium were exactly what the Dark War entities of Chaos looked for. Another hey. factor in the resentment and frustration felt by the Primarchs and some higher officers in Space Marine Legions would be the Council of Terror. This was a governing body charged with the administration and infrastructure control of the Crusade and Imperium as a whole. It was controversial among the Astartes as it comprised an all-human council. Primarchs and Space Marines alike were not given permission to sit with the Terra Council. Their role was for that of war, and all military matters were handled by the War Master. One of the most primary council members was the previously mentioned Malkador the Sigilite. Malkador was no simple man though. He was a psyker of immense power and used these abilities to reach out into the vast realms of space. He was a close aide to the Emperor during Earth's unification wars and is said to have formed the Administratum of Terror. So he is no mere administrator, but a vastly important figure, as important in fact as any Primarch. Some of the Emperor's sons though did not feel that the Imperium should be run by human bureaucrats and so the Council of Terror would become another chip on the shoulder and a contributing factor to heresy. One last and specific act though would turn at least one Primarch away from the Emperor and continue to raise doubts in others. The disciplining of Lorgar. Lorgar was the Primarch of the Word Bearers or as they often referred to themselves, the Bearers of the Word. The word referred to is the Emperor's word. However, the word bearers were almost fundamentalist in their beliefs. Lorgar believed with every fibre of him that the Emperor himself was a divine being, one true god of mankind. They believed this to the core and preached it across their homeworld as well as any they encountered during the Expeditionary Crusades. But the Emperor had long since outlawed any concept of belief and religion, imposing a strictly secular rule of law in the Imperial Truth to create a constructively rationalist society. For the longest time though, these religious emanations were suspected and tolerated by the Imperial Council, and even to an extent by the Emperor. Eventually, however, the word bearers came under closer scrutiny by the simple fact that by comparison to other legions, they were unbearably slow with their conquest rate during the crusade. An investigation fleet was sent by the Imperial Council to establish what was causing this slow progress. On arrival at some of the conquered worlds of the word bearers, they found their answer. To the fleet commander's horror, they had discovered that the word bearers had been spending years indoctrinating and converting the worlds to the illegal and false faith of the Imperium. This was a tediously slow process and took significantly longer than usual conquests, as was often so bloody due to the worlds initially resisting having an enforced faith. This egregious practice was considered an abject failure of duty by the Imperium and the Emperor himself. Worse still, it came to light that the word bearers had been employing a standard practice to execute those who did not renounce their faith and accept that of the Imperium and Emperor as the divine faith, which only served to pour more fuel onto the flames of outrage. The Emperor was absolutely enraged by this notion that he should be worshipped as a god and the actions of the word bearers in his name slaughtering those who refused to accept the emperor's divinity stank of the religious excesses that had so often poisoned human history and the emperor had witnessed firsthand throughout the ages so the word bearers had not only broken his principal rules but also wasted vast amounts of time and resources all the worlds they had brought into the Imperium had to be purged in an extremely traumatic process, wasting more lives and more resources. To balance these incomprehensible actions, the Emperor would publicly humiliate Lorgar. To publicly reprimand a Primarch in front of his Space Marines and even present humans was an unprecedented act, and it cut Lorgar to the core. In one encounter, his faith was publicly ripped from him by the Emperor and all the worlds they had conquered were to be purged. Lorgar was beside himself, as were all the word bearers, to not only have their faith burned away, but to also know that all their years of efforts counted for Wasted. naught 
was an unbearable burden to carry. It is said that the Emperor did not want to break and ruin the word bearers or Lorgar. He was not vindictive in that way. He wanted to merely set them back on the path to being an effective force for the Imperium of Mankind. To cure this corruption, the Emperor turned to the glorious Ultramarines and Robert Gilliman, known for his exceptional tact and unflinching loyalty to the Emperor. The Ultramarines were the word bearers mirror and shadow alike in so many ways and different in so many others. A living example of what the word bearers had the potential to be. The Emperor ordered a task force comprised of Ultramarines, his elite personal bodyguards and the Imperial Council Regent Malkador the Sigilite. Their mission? To raise the capital city of the planet Kerr to the ground. A planet of high importance to the word bearers who considered its capital Monarchia the perfect city because of the citizens intense religious devotion and the sheer number of cathedrals and monuments dedicated to the worship of the emperor as the god of humanity. Following a temporary mass evacuation of bewildered human citizens who could not understand what crime they had committed sent out distress signals to the word bearers who they considered to be angels. Friends. Angels. The Ultramarines, though, continued their mission and engaged in the orbital destruction of Monarchia. The Wordbearers Legion arrived to answer the distress calls of the planet, only to find to their utter confusion the Ultramarines in orbit. The Wordbearers were ordered to assemble planet side. 100,000 Marines were ordered within sight of the smouldering, raised ruins of Monarchia. Hey, and the Emperor himself 100, stood. 100,000? The word bearers were forced, along with all others in attendance, including Lorgar, to kneel before him in the ashes of the city, which stood for all they had believed and done in the name of the Emperor and the Imperium. He explained to them in no uncertain terms that they had failed in duty, that their efforts had been futile and wasted beliefs were an abhorrence. He was no god, no angel, no divine being, but a man. No such belief would be permitted in his Imperium. The Emperor departed, leaving a Primarch humiliated and a Legion humbled. Lorgar was physically and psychologically numbed by the Emperor's actions. The raising of the city of Monarchia was a trauma almost too great for many of the word bearers to cope with, and had it not been for their strength of genetics, they would have likely been mass suicides and insanity. Lorgar himself, though, fell into a deep melancholy that would burn harder and brighter within him as days turned to weeks turned to months. Why is this sequence of events so important? In the future years of the Imperium, it was said that all that would later come to pass was born in this microcosm. That the mission and humiliation carried out here would be recalled as the catalyst of a galactic civil war. The ruination of the word bearers is critical in understanding the next sequence of events. They were left reeling from the events on Kerr, as well as the ritual humiliation and destruction of the Legion's faith. The f now guys, I'm a little confused here. Maybe I just like glazed over them saying why they were upset with the word bearers converting all those planets to the Imperium. Was it because he believed him to be a divine being and not a man, and the Emperor of Man wanted to be viewed as a man, not as a divine being. And man, that was probably a lot of planets they had to purge if, uh, if that's the case. Let's keep going. The fate of the word bearers at this time is sketchy due to the destructive nature of this period and the events to follow. But it is known that they disappeared for a time, seemingly lost in a whirlwind of confusion disillusionment and even rage. The Emperor's hope that they would be why. set straight on the path of the Imperial Truth was flawed and their resentment hugely underestimated. Amen. Instead they withdrew, wandering the galaxy, seeking, waiting for a light of clarity to guide them. It seems likely that Lorgar's fall began after Monarchia, that the dark powers of the warp reached out to him in his despair and offered him that which the Emperor had denied him a divine power to believe in. It is not known whom these voices that counseled him were. It's possible, but entirely speculative, that as with Horus later, some of his closest officers, such as Erebus, the word bearer's first chaplain, would be the first to be corrupted and then begin the spread of darkness. 
What is certain though, is that when the word bearers reappeared to rejoin the Great Imperial Crusade, they appeared to be refocused as the Emperor had hoped. But this was far from the truth. The word bearers now no longer served the Emperor or humanity and were the very first Space Marine Legion to fall to the darkness of chaos. The war between humanity and chaos would still not come until more of the Emperor's crusading forces had been seeded with dark betrayal. Horus Lupercal, favour of the Emperor, war master of the crusade, would become the apex of these events. The real treachery would begin on a small planet named Davin. This world had been Davin. easily absorbed into the Imperium by Horus and his legion, the Lunar Wolves, some 60 years previously. The warrior people living there quickly realised they were outclassed and bowed to the powers of the Imperium. Smart. Horus was impressed with their realism, honour and strength. Spending time there, the Lunar Wolves brought away from Davin the concept of the Warrior Lodge, a close clique of senior brothers who would share their knowledge and opinions evenly without rank obstruction. The concept of lodges, guilds or clans within a legion or imperial force was strictly outlawed by the Emperor as something which could brew dangerous opinions and dissent, as evidently turned out to be the case. Horus decided that he knew better. Now Erebus, the aforementioned first chaplain of the word bearers, was at this point fully corrupted by chaos. He reported to the Lunar Wolves that Commander Temba, the governor of Davin, and his forces had turned renegade and dug themselves into a fortress on Davin's moon. Horus led an assault force to clear the moon and extract Temba personally. On the surface, his forces were confronted by the foul, reanimated remains of Temba's outpost, who had evidently succumbed to the chaos plague of Nurgle's rot skewing them into horrific Papa. parodies of the human form. Nurgle. Horus slew the grossly altered Temba personally, but not before Temba managed to strike a blow to Horus using the advanced blade, the Anatheme. The Anatheme, you will recall, was do? the highly advanced blade stolen decades previous by Erebus from the people known as the Interrex. The weapons okay. appeared to be semi-sentient, as the Interrex claimed the weapons could be instructed to recognize a particular person, which gave them the ability to mortally wound that person. The Interrex did not know how to produce these weapons, but had confiscated them from a Xenos race known as the Kinebrak. It seems right. clear that Erebus orchestrated the whole sequence of events on Davin's moon, and potentially worse, had already been corrupted by Chaos even prior to his theft of the Anatheme from the Interrex years before. The distorted Chaos-riddled Temba had been instructed to speak Horus Lubakal's name to the blade. This meant that upon striking the greatest Kill. Primarch of the Imperium, it would wound him in such a way as to be beyond even his demigod-like powers of healing. The fate of the Anatheme would still have importance in the years to come. Horus was taken back to his ship, the Vengeful Spirit, where apothecaries frustratingly determined his wound could not be healed naturally or otherwise. Horus's Mournival, his lodge of closest officers, took him in their despair to the Serpent Lodge on Davin, where Erebus assured them he knew how to heal the War Master in a special spiritual ceremony. This was, of course, all part of Erebus's plan. During this ritual, Horus's spirit would be transferred into the warp along with Erebus, disguised as one of the Warmaster's closest friends, Hastur Sajanus, captain of the Fourth Company. This out-of-body experience showed Horus a terrifying vision of the future, which unbeknownst to him were caused by his very actions. Bringing the Imperium into an age of repressive, violent and superstitious regime where the Emperor and some of the most loyal Primarchs were worshipped as divine beings by the fanatical and ignorant masses of humanity. The Chaos Gods portrayed themselves as the victims of the Emperor's psychic might who had been suppressed throughout the ages and had no interest themselves in controlling the material world. Horus, already having grown jealous and deeply resentful of the perceived poor treatment at the hands of the Emperor, and was one of many of the Astartes legions afraid of the concept of a peace, wherein all for which they had fought would be turned over to weak-willed mortal men, whilst his legions were cast aside and left as peacekeepers without a purpose. 
These were the Emperor's wishes. You see, the Astartes were always a tool to save humanity and bring power back to mankind, not just to subjugate it. Horus, in his weakened and embittered state, was very suggestible and would accept this twisted and misunderstood prophecy. But there was one thing Erebus had not counted on. Horus's brother, Magnus the Red, Primarch of the Thousand Sons, a legion and chapter who had widely embraced psychers and their unique powers, had continued to study the forbidden arts of warp manipulation and sorcerous powers. The Cyclopean giant of Magnus appeared within Horus's vision, revealing Erebus's true identity and begging Horus not to fall in to the temptations of chaos. It was all in vain though. Horus had by now already decided that if he anyone deserved gone. to be worshipped as a god, then it was he. The godlike warp demons of chaos healed Horus's wounds and between them made a deal. In exchange for the immense power he would gain, as well as ruling power over the mortal galaxy, he would deliver to them the Emperor. It's here the dark speak. chaos gods feared most, yeah. as they knew he alone stood with there enough power to potentially destroy them. Although Horus had always been an immensely skillful military leader, his true genius was in the manipulation of others. This was often remarked upon by his brother Primox, Rogal Dawn of the Imperial Fists, once noting to Garvil Loken, Dawn. who you remember was the Lunar Wolves captain and a member of the Mournival, that Horus had Loken put forward a campaign of war so his character would be more well known as a peacemaker than a warmonger. Dawn said, you understand what Horus had you do this morning. He had primed the Mournival to back him, Loken. He is cultivating the air of a peacemaker, for that plays well across the world to the Imperium. This morning he wanted someone other than himself to suggest unleashing the legions for war. This skill of manipulation would be especially important now. It was one thing for the Chaos Aberrations to turn a few men and even a Primarch, but to turn legions and still more Primarchs? the strongest willed and most loyal of the Emperor's forces to Chaos? How would this be possible? Well, it would in part because Horus did not declare himself outright as a disciple of Chaos, nor would he follow immediately the darkest of their practices. As had been the case until now, the game being played was one of subtlety and deception. Horus began implementing throughout the legions the concept of the Mournival, that that he had allowed first within the Lunar Wolves. The Mournival Lodge enabled officers to group together in secret and lay the seeds of discontent and mutiny. Horus would also capitalize on the current negative feelings among some of his fellow Primarchs and then the refracted disillusionment among some of the legions. Lorgar and the word bearers had already turned to chaos following their world shattering humiliation by the Emperor. Horus would engage legions of Astartes, Imperial troops, and even several Mars Titan legions with the principal concept that Horus now perceived the Emperor, powerful as he was, did not deserve the unreserved praise and recognition of the human race. More Astartes legions would now join the traitors. Angron and the World Eaters, Mortarion and his Death Guard, Fulgrim and the Emperor's Children were among the first to side with the War Master. Others would later fall, including the Iron Warriors, Night Lords, Alpha Legion, and lastly, the Thousand Sons. It had become clear that the Primarchs were far from the perfect demigod-like human form they were perceived to be. Although technically each Primarch was physically and mentally godlike compared to a standard human, they still bore all of humanity's virtues as well as their, their forms, weaknesses such as ego, greed, envy, arrogance, rage, and more besides. These superhuman warriors were meant to be the saviors of mankind, but instead they could be the downfall of everything that had been salvaged and achieved. The Thousand Sons Legion would be a particularly tragic story. Their Primarch Magnus the Red, who you remember had attempted to prevent Horus from falling to darkness whilst experiencing his outer body experience to the warp on Davin. Yeah. Magnus and the Thousand Sons Legion had begun to use psychic powers and warp sorcery as part of their Legion's general practices. 
This was actually outlawed by the Emperor, who was cautious of using psychic power in only controlled services. It's surprising they chose this path to break with imperial law, however, it seems that they actually bore a natural affinity for such practices and as with many things, likely started out small before becoming more widespread. In time, many Space Marine Legions and chapters would use sanctioned psychers in the new librarian branch of the forces, but in these early days there was no regulation or established command. As a consequence, many of the Thousand Suns Marines would suffer whole body deterioration as they would eventually become consumed by the warp powers unable to control or prevent this. It was for this reason that Magnus the Red was able to travel into the warp and see Horus in his most dire of situations. Magnus, after this incident, was so grief-stricken that rather than physically travel to Earth and speak to the Emperor, which now in hindsight would have been the far better choice, he chose to use his psychic power to reach out and speak to the Emperor himself at the Imperial Palace on Terror. But this would shatter all the psychic wards the Emperor had placed on the palace and severely damage the project being secretly worked on by the Emperor. This itself was connected to the psychic paths of the webway, the gateways used by the Eldar, and previously the Old Ones. This choice by Magnus was catastrophic and a rash miscalculation. His psychic assault on the Imperial Palace, his panic and frustration and anger and trauma gave free reign to the warp and its evil inhabitants to invade terror. Millions of psychers died instantly as their attuned Bang. minds were burned out or demons tore them apart. Warp storms consumed entire settlements, shockwaves flattened structures around the world. Having strictly outlawed Magnus' use of sorcery and refusing to believe that Horus, his most trusted son, would betray him, the Emperor concluded wrongly for the traitor to be Magnus and the Thousand Sons. This error would be yet another travesty of judgement among the many during this whole sorry period. The Emperor ordered Lehman Russ and his Space Wolves to engage and destroy Magnus and the Thousand Sons. But Magnus, now defeated physically and mentally, cast out by his father, they were turned away from the Imperium and into traps to entice them into the darkness of chaos. Horus was all too aware that there were some Primarchs and Legions too loyalist to ever be persuaded away from the Imperium, such as the Imperial Fists, Ultramarines, Blood and Dark Angels. Horus would instead send these legions far away to the far reaches of the Empire on missions designed to keep them busy while the traitors would descend on busy. Earth to destroy the Imperium and most critically the Emperor himself. As we outlined earlier, there would now take place many events which would lead some further astray and for the Emperor to become more aware that something was extremely wrong in the Imperium. These can be covered in more detail later. Magnus of the Thousand Sons was for the Emperor, as far as he was aware, a lone corrupter, distorted by his unlicensed use of the warp. This of course was sadly the extreme opposite right. of the actual situation, but the extreme destruction and loss of life on Earth after it had been contained, as well as the damage to the Emperor's ongoing gateway project, would be enough to cloud his judgement. Horus though would now move up to expand upon the early seeds of betrayal in the following campaigns of the Isfahan system. Horus would order the virus bombing of Isfahan III, a planet that had declared itself separate from the Imperium. Many loyalist marines from traitor legions were actually planetside when Horus and the orbital navy performed exterminatus on the planet, killing all 12 billion inhabitants including the Space Marines from multiple legions. Horus watched from orbit, declaring, Let the galaxy burn. The virus bombs laid waste to the planet, devouring any organic material they encountered, disintegrating humans and seeping into the suits and armour of any Astartes. The storms of the virus raged until the planet was nothing more than a barren desert. The few remaining Loyalist Space Marines would eventually be butchered by their brothers until Horus ordered an orbital bombardment until nothing remained alive on the surface of Ace Farm 3. Dang, he ain't playing Enter around. Captain Garrow of the 7th Company Death Guard Legion. 
Nathaniel Garrow is one of my favourite heroes of the Horus Heresy and perhaps all of the Warhammer 40,000 universe, namely because he was fundamentally responsible for saving the Imperium. His unwavering loyalty and strength of character, which apparently went beyond even some of the Primarchs. He is also a legendary character of the age because of what he would become later after the period of heresy, but again that is another story. Garrow bore witness to the massacre on Istvan III and was quick to understand the real horror not only of this specific event but what was happening at large. Realising that he would have to escape not only the fleet of the War Master, the Sons of Horus, previously the Lunar Wolves, and the Emperor's children, but also his own legion, they would make a warp jump aboard an old fleet ship, the Eisenstein. Without having time to chart its route or destination, this left them then marooned as well as being subject to multiple attacks from the warp by the dark forces of chaos and the specific deity Nurgle who had corrupted oh, and Papa mutated Nurgle. his own Death Guard legion. Despite all this, they survived and proceeded to detonate their ship's core in the vain hope of attracting a ship to come and rescue them. Luckily for the crew, they succeeded and the vessel approaching turned out to be an Imperial Fist Astartes barge containing none other than the Primarch Rogal Dawn himself. Trying to convince Dawn of Horus and the other Legion's betrayal though was a near impossible task. The suggestion sent him into such a fit of rage he nearly executed Garrow on the spot and would have been doomed to failure were it not for the Remembrancers. The Remembrancers were an order of historians, journalists and civilians from Earth at the time who were sent along with the expeditionary fleets of the Great Crusade. Their function was to chronicle deeds, events and generally record the history so that we could then hold Smart. that for the future Imperium of Man. Remembrances were generally seen as very reliable sources of information, especially those who had any psychic capabilities if they were psychers and could actually record information simply by visualizing that, by seeing it. And when Rogal Dawn could actually see the events that had unfolded, he had no choice but to accept them. Returning to Terra, Dawn would speak to the Emperor and finally the betrayal and heresy would come into the light. Garrow, though, in immense frustration, despite all his efforts, was not able to speak to the Emperor himself, but was stationed on the Lunar Colony along with the remaining Loyalist Death Guard and Imperial Navy crew of the Eisenstein. The Imperial forces on Earth considered their presence too dangerous to allow them to roam freely. Horus Lupercal had now extinguished the last shreds of loyalty from the three legions under his command who were now complete in their misguided transition to chaos. His next target in the campaign was Istvan V. Here he would establish a command post and reinforce his position. The Emperor, now in a fit of despair and rage at the actions of Horus, commanded seven legions of Astartes to Wipe attack and subdue the traitors and subsequently return them to Terra to face their actions. However, unbeknownst to the Emperor, at least half of these legions had already been deceived and strayed from loyalty to the Imperium. They had not yet made That's their stars clear but represented a dangerous deception to the Imperium. The first wave of attacks to Istvan V were carried out by the Loyalist Legions, the Salamanders, the Raven Guard, and the Iron Hands. Horus had already been passed information of their landing sites and this would cost them horrific losses at this initial contact. Worse would come though, the four remaining legions to attack were no longer loyal to the Imperium. The Night Lords, Word Bearers, Iron Warriors and Alpha Legion descended to attack in a brutal combined assault, slaughtering the remnants of the three Imperial Legions. This event would be known from here on here. as the Isvan V drop site massacre. Four legions, Things looked Stardis wiped out, Dang. The strongest legions were still tasked to the fringes of the galaxy and there seemed little to stand between Horus and his now seven strong fleet of Astartes legions. Not to mention the further forces of corrupted Imperial Navy, the victorious Dark Mechanicum who were fighting the Schism of Mars, the civil war between factions on Mars loyal to the Imperium and Horus and now successfully they had won their campaign there. 
the traitor legions on Horus would assault and destroy many loyal Imperial bastions as they travelled towards Terra, taking years to do so in the process. By now, the Warmaster had amassed a massive army, comprising multiple groups including Titans, Astartes and advanced war gear, corrupted Imperial forces and even cultists from worlds who could spread discord and disrupt Imperial worlds through terrorism or cult activity. The word bearers especially reveled in this, often finding that their worlds, previously they converted to the divinity of the Emperor, were more than willing within a fairly short space of time to worship them again as gods or angels and were a great asset to factor into their battle tactics and use where appropriate these expendable, gullible souls to support their forces. Gotta have some. Fortunately for the Imperium, one thing was slowing down Horus mm. and his legions. Logistics. Despite acquiring a massive force, Horus found he was unable to How move do it efficiently around them given around. the limitations of the warp vessels in his fleet, and this did buy the Loyalist side some time. There is one other unmentioned force Horus found available to him, the that demons. of the warp demons themselves. However, interestingly at this time, despite many Space Marine Legions pledging themselves to Horus and to Chaos, they still viewed these creatures as dangerous warp phenomena and opposite to their principles. This shows that at the time it's believable that many of the Space Marines aligned to Horus were perhaps not entirely aware of what it was they were signing up for and had perceived this more as a political rebellion to impose a new order to the Imperium, rather than the truth of the matter which was that they were in fact surrendering it to a true fall into a hellish reality and a foul darkness that later awaited them all. This would also be in part down to the previous decisions Oops. to instigate a rule of Bye -bye. ignorance over such matters, meaning many Astartes warriors genuinely had no real knowledge of what chaos was or what it represented. Although it has to be said that this was rapidly changing and faster yeah. among some legions than others. Matters mm. overall were made worse by the sheer amount of confusion reigning at this time. The warp had been disturbed, making warp travel again difficult. As outlined, this was both a positive and a negative for both sides concerned. It also made communication difficult, meaning some worlds could not be warned and meant that many did not know the truth of the matter or who indeed they could trust. Rogel Dawn, Primarch of the Imperial Fists, had been stationed on Terra for some years now after his return with Nathaniel Garrow, and barely rested in his activities to prepare an insurmountable defence of Terra. However, his task was made all the more difficult by the warp storms which prevented ease of reinforcement as well as communication. In addition, Mars now failed to repel the Dark Mechanicum and had fallen to the Warmaster's forces and as such had to be continually blockaded and prevented from launching its own attacks to Earth. As far as the Emperor, Malkador and Imperial Fists were concerned, the spearhead on Isfahan V had been a catastrophic failure. Other legions, such as the Ultramarines, were now completely isolated and out of contact, and so they could do nothing but watch the galaxy burn around them, as Horus himself had stated he would as he oversaw the virus bombing of Isfahan III. Despite this period often being documented as clear-cut death guard against blood angels and so on, it was far more chaotic than this. Although battles and confrontations would occur, it was not as simple as the Warmaster declaring X Legion is now under my command. A legion comprised thousands of space marines, and they would rarely be all stationed in one location at once. That Consequently, in the back? this fragmentation meant many could return from stationing elsewhere to find to their horror the truth of the matter. As outlined previously, although space marines can often appear to be mechanical machines of war, they are just as complex as any human in their thoughts, decisions and moralities, hence why Horus saw it necessary to slaughter so many loyalists from the legions he would call his own on Isfahan III. This meant that many smaller groups of marines, when returning to communication with their legion, would either meet a bloody fate at the hands of their brothers should they refuse to convert to the Warmaster's cause, or instead they would flee to form fragmented groups of rare marines known as Black Shields. Now just to diverge very quickly, Black Shields are a rare form of Astartes who have fully severed themselves from their parent legion or chapter but who still remain loyal to the Imperium. 
In this early time, however, only some of the marines would obscure their shoulder plates. Others would wear their legion colours and heraldry, proudly believing themselves to be the purest warriors, uncorrupted by the darkness and the last remnants of their previous but now ruined glory. Later point. in time, though, all these rogue Astartes would black out their armour to remain anonymous as their legion loyalty became a deep shame and irrelevant to their personal missions. Black Shield Space Marines would later become the fabled Death Watch Marines, who dedicate themselves to endlessly battling Xenos using unorthodox methods and allying with fellow Black Shields whose prior legion heritage is irrelevant and often best unspoken of. It is uncommon for the Black Shield to reveal more than bare details other than his name, basic training experiences and so on. They fight in the name of the Imperium but remain in a state of self-imposed exile. The Death Watch Black Shield Marines would also fight in a manner divergent to normal Marines. They will willingly sacrifice themselves where necessary or take on objectives that others would consider a death sentence. In many Quiet. ways, their lives seem to be a form of penance, carrying the shame and weight of sin thrown down by their legions upon their shoulders, but all the while remaining staunchly loyal to the Emperor. Horus See continued his unending you. campaign of betrayal now. In a bizarre parody of the Imperial Crusade, each world over which the Warmaster's shadow fell, a simple choice was given. Total submission and surrender, Convert or total destruction, or and a lifetime of slavery, and ultimately, a miserable death. This campaign was also certainly one of fear-mongering and compliance for sibling worlds in a given system. For any world marked for destruction and genocide was never fully extinguished in this manner. It would conveniently allow those survivors who had not simply lost their minds from witnessing the horrors unleashed by the Dark Astartes could convey their experience to other neighbouring worlds and thereby assuring their near immediate surrender to the Warmaster's fleet. In this sense, these near total annihilation attacks on planets by the Warmaster were not true exterminatus as was seen on Isfahan 3, rather they were a clever and brutal propaganda tool to yet again demonstrate Horus's adept Power. ability in the art of war he had perfected through the years of the Imperial Crusades. By now, some nine of the twenty Space Marine Legions were under the command of Horus. An interesting but specifically relevant aside to this is to mention the 2nd and 11th Space Marine Legions. They would have all records of their existence destroyed White. and no history or explanation given as to their origin, actions or fate. So they got the complete hair. and utter erasure of all records of the 2nd and 11th Marines Legions though, is considered basically. by Imperial historians as the most successful edict of obliteration ever carried out. However, Fragments of information do exist through quoted literature or documents, and it seems that these two legions' records were eradicated prior to the Horus Heresy. We have no way of knowing for sure what happened to the erased two legions, but it seems likely they were precursors to the events of the Heresy. The Primarch of the Space Wolves, Lehman Russ, is recorded as stating that Space Marines had been previously tasked with fighting one another when speaking to Caspar Horsor, who questioned him the unprecedented, like Astartes fighting Astartes, like the route being called to sanction another legion. That's not Pat. unprecedented. No, that is not unprecedented. This gives credence to the possibility that the Space Wolves are the Emperor's preferred execution legion, as they would be later tasked with the destruction of the Thousand Sons and Magnus the Red. Another quote stated that the Wolves will be loosed again. This small fragment suggests it is not the first time they'd faced such a mission. Malkador the Sigilite and Rogal Dawn of the Imperial Fists would also shed some fragmented light on this history. Malkador would say, Horus has three of his brother legions with him. You have your fists and thirteen others. Would that it were fifteen, mused Dawn. Do not even think it, my friend, warned Malkador. They are lost to us forever. I know, said Dawn. A conversation between Primarch Rogal Dawn and Malkador the Sigilite, and this leads us to speculate that a great darkness caused them to be lost prior to heresy. 
but the most telling of all would be part of Horus's vision during his out-of-body experience on Davin where he would have among other delusions a reminiscence back in time to the DNA laboratories of the Emperor. We know that the warp creatures had originally scattered the Primarchs so it seems entirely likely that this vision was at least in part accurate. Horus would describe that. He stopped by the tank with eleven stenciled upon it. The eleventh Primarch feeling the untapped glories that might have lain ahead for what grew within, but knowing that they would never come to pass. This could suggest that Chaos wanted to demonstrate to Horus that he was not the first to be corrupted, and that where previously they had failed and subsequently were he destroyed by the Emperor, succeed. he would succeed. Yeah. These glimpses are interesting, but do beg the question, if such a fate had befallen the 2nd and 11th legions, why was the Emperor not more cautious to allow such darkness to encroach and infect his Astartes again? On the other hand, perhaps it was precisely attention. these earlier corruptions which led the Emperor to his course of outlawing knowledge of chaos, the old adage of what you don't know can't hurt you. Additionally, perhaps the fact that or if indeed these two it. now erased legions Sir. are corrupted and then crushed by the Space Wolves, could this have lulled the Emperor into a false sense of security, believing any further corruptions to be also surmountable? We could speculate that the Chaos Gods perhaps even allowed these legions to be destroyed prior to the Horus Heresy so as to deliberately misdirect the Emperor into believing them to be weaker or less capable of force than they actually were. There is no definitive answer, this is all supposition, but the possibilities and ramifications are particularly intriguing. Whatever the reasons for these prior events and the consequences they would carry, one thing was now certain. Horus's fleet seemed unstoppable as it approached Terra. Yeah. Rogal Dawn and Malkador the Sigilite were receiving the fragmented survivors from the Isfahan 5 massacre at this time and began to realise the grim reality of what they were facing. They hurriedly attempted to contact the Space Wolves and White Scars who as they were about to return to Terra were now engaged by the traitors of the Alpha Legion. This made retreat difficult but the White Scars were able to break free to return to Terra with the Wolves vowing to follow them on once they had eradicated the Alpha Legion's force. The Ultramarines similarly had been engaged on the planet of Kalth against the Wordbearers. Robert Gilliman and the Ultramarines received reinforcements from their vast legion to form one of the greatest forces in the Imperium now left standing and they would repel the shattered wordbearers and set course for Terra after receiving their communication from Malkador. However, Gilliman realised all too well they would likely arrive too late to make a significant difference, as had been Horus's original intention on posting them as far from Earth as was possible without it raising suspicion. So you can't help Now the race was really on, as nearly all the Space Marine Legion's loyalist and traitor alike headed, headed for to Holy Terra. Terra to determine the final battle for supremacy of the galaxy. Despite all their best efforts, only the White Scars, Blood Angels and Imperial Fists were able to reach Terra before the Traitor Legions arrived. The Loyalists were also supported with three Mechanicus Titan Legions and millions of Imperial Guards soldiers. Their objective was less to defeat the Traitors, that task was not in anybody's mind. Their sole task was simple and twofold. They must protect the Emperor at all costs and they must survive long enough for reinforcements from the remaining Loyalist Legions who were still en oh, route to Terra. The Holy Terra! The Battle of Terra began as expected, with mass orbital bombardments from both the surface to orbit and vice versa. Luna, the Imperial Naval Station, also launched massive attacks with its huge orbital defence system, which sustained the traitors with heavy losses, but sadly not heavy enough to make any significant impact. Horus would destroy first the lunar defences and then the ground defence systems on Earth. It was now open to attack. The first drop pods landed on Terra, carrying the corrupted hellish Chaos Marines who battled the Loyalists for every step of ground they took. In securing the docking port's planet side, the traitors were able to reinforce with thousands more Marines along with the corrupted Dark Mechanicum Titans. Cultists also practiced their invocations which brought demons large and small out from the warp and into reality unleashing their horrors on the loyalists both Astartes and Imperial Guard alike. Bang. The forces of chaos assaulted the Imperial Palace relentlessly, some being led on by the Primarch now turned demon Prince Angron of the World Eaters. 
but each time they attacked, the Blood Angels led by their Primarch Sanguinius would repel them. The White Scars Legion attempted to draw the Dark Forces away from the palace, they but fast. each time would be forced into submission, retreating back into the relative shelter of the palaces. Horus, frustrated at this point, and all too aware he was running out of time, ordered one of the Titan Legions to demolish entire sections of the Imperial War. Despite grievous losses, the Titans, led by the infamous Imperator class battle titan Dis Array, smashed breaches in the Imperial Palace's defences, which the traitors then flooded through. Jakati Khan, Primarch of the White Scars, decided at this time on a change in tactic. Instead of trying to repel the seemingly endless forces of Chaos Marines, he hey, swept a lightning raid to the Lion's Gate spaceport, catching the traitors at the port completely off guard. They were able to secure it quickly and reactivate the orbital defences, which began immediately destroying all descending traitor drop pods and landing transports. In a single action, they had cut the reinforcements of the traitors in half and dealt a substantial blow. They, might have a they also tried to secure the second main port known as the Eternity Wall, but were unsuccessful as the Chaos Forces had now reinforced their positions. The battle at the main palace was not going well now either, and the Loyalists had been pushed back to the Eternity Gate, the sole point of entry into the inner sanctum of the Imperial Palace. The Marines, the Blood Angels and Imperial Fists were to hold back the attacking Chaos forces while the remaining Loyalists made it through the gate to safety. Sanguinius, the Blood Angels Primarch, would now face a terrifying prospect as he flew against a greater demon of Corn, clashing together head-on as they battled in the air, flying above the mortal forces in a ferocious and blurring battle of godlike ability. Bye. Sanguinius would ultimately be victorious, breaking the demonic creature and throwing its shattered body to the howling heretics below. The warp gate project Take the Emperor this, had been heretics. working on resided in this chamber, and it now risked becoming their undoing. Initially, it required only a small portion of the Emperor's psychic attention, but after the damage wrought by Magnus of the Thousand Suns in attempting to reach more. the Emperor, it subsequently was damaged so badly that it required a significantly higher proportion of the Emperor's powers to keep it closed. Combined with the fact that the forces of Chaos were fighting to use this portal, it became an immense burden to maintain it safely. The Emperor now called on Malkador the Sigilite, informing him that he was required to take his place on the psychic amplifier known as the Golden Throne. This provided the psychic shielding needed to protect the new, human-built sections of the webway, which had been the Emperor's secret project and was intended to be the final gift to humanity before the Horus Heresy had begun. The Emperor's original choice of his replacement on the artifact had been Magnus the Red, but now Malkador was the only legitimate successor, being one of the few human remaining psychers with enough strength to carry out the duty. In the final days of the siege, the Emperor ordered Malkador to summon 12 men of character, skill, and determination. These would be tested and trained to become an elite group of investigators intended to root out treachery across the Imperium and in the centuries to come to prevent any event like the Horus Heresy from occurring again. This would become the earliest stirrings of the Inquisition and also later the highly secretive chapter known as the Grey Knights. The Emperor also ah. told Malkador to steal himself as he would need to prepare to make an unbearable sacrifice. What you talking about, Malkador Willis? would return from his mission to recruit the foundation of the Inquisition. Using his powerful psychic subterfuge, Malkador and his new recruits were able to pass unscathed through the battle lines and come before the Emperor within the inner gates of the Imperial Palace. Malkador brought before the Emperor his 12 men to be judged for their suitability, and the Emperor saw that Malkador had chosen wisely. Of the 12, four were mortal lords and administrators of the Imperium, possessing an inquisitive nature and unyielding strength of mind. The other eight were space marines, whose abilities were as peerless as their dedication to the Emperor. Some marines were from legions that had abandoned the Emperor in favour of Horus's dark promises, but these battle brothers had never lost their staunch loyalty and had fought the heresy from within in many ways and they were the truest expression of the Imperium and carried an even stronger will than their Lord Primarchs. 
Malkador the Sigilite ascended to the Golden Throne, replacing the Emperor who stood before his loyal captains, Rogal Dawn of the Imperial Fists and Sanguinius of the Blood Angels. Malkador could no longer physically speak, his mind consumed by the concentration he had to bring to bear in order to control the tempest of psychic forces consuming him. The Emperor directed the attention of the two Primarchs, the demigods of mankind, to look upon this mere mortal. Malkador, a powerful psyker, but not an Astartes, not a Primarch, just a man. The Emperor declared to them, Behold, the greatest sacrifice of our age. Malkador the Sigilite is no more. Henceforth, he shall always and only ever be Malkador the Hero. Malkador would only be yeah. able to stand the psychic assault on him for a few hours. Powerful as he was, he was but a fraction of the power of the Emperor, and his body, mind and soul would be consumed in a matter of hours. Malkador the Sigilite was a true hero of humanity, saving it from total destruction on numerous occasions, ultimately sacrificing himself, himself. for the will of his friend, the Emperor. After 55 days, the Siege of Terror had kept the enemy at the gates, but only just. Both sides knew the defeat of the Imperium was near, and all that was required was the defence or destruction of the Eternity Gate. Horus, knowing this, and that he must complete the siege before the arrival of the Loyalist reinforcements from the other Space Marine Legions, prepared to teleport to the surface from his flagship, the Vengeful Spirit, to lead this final assault in person. <coughs> The Wordbearer's first chaplain and prime traitor Erebus broke the news to Horus that their demonic allies in the warp had informed them the Dark Angels and Space War Legions were now nearing terror, and the vast force of Ultramarines were hurry. a short distance away by now. Hearing this news, Horus despaired. All seemed lost. He needed more time to break the most secure enclave of the Imperial Palace, and the massive Imperial reinforcements were only hours away. Horus decided on a dangerous gamble. Dropping the shields of his flagship, he opened the gateway for the Loyalists to board his vessel. The Emperor would not waste this opportunity and teleported aboard the Vengeful Spirit with his elite personal guard, the Legio Custodes. The Primarch Sanguinius and Rogal Dawn, several companies of Imperial Fists and Blood Angels, veteran Marines in the assault. Finding themselves though scattered now throughout the ship, they fought a series of close quarter battles against hardened Chaos Marines to reach the bridge of the ship and Horus. Sanguinius, the Blood Angel's Primarch, reached his brother Horus first, and the Warmaster attempted to turn his previously oldest and closest friend among the other Primarchs to Chaos one last time. When Sanguinius refused to be corrupted, Horus attacked. Wounded from his many battles on terror and the battle with the greater demon, Sanguinius proved to be easily no match for Horus, who was now at the peak of his demonic power, bearing multiple marks of chaos. Come on, Horus Sanguinius! To death the angel with cruel ease. An alternate version of this event recorded in the Imperial Records has Sanguinius cutting a small hole in Horus's Terminator armor before he died. This chink in the armor would aid in the Emperor's battle against Horus. When the Emperor entered the bridge, he saw the winged corpse of the angelic Sanguinius lying at Horus' feet. Horus engaged the Emperor, calling him foolish for refusing the power that Chaos offered. Horus proclaimed that if the Emperor would kneel before him, he would spare his life. The Emperor knew well the ancient trap that had snared Horus. And the Emperor told the corrupted Primarch that he was the deluded slave of Chaos, not its master, for no mortal could ever truly claim to be more than a simple pawn of the ruinous powers. At a point. Snarling with frustration, Horus hurled bolts of demonic lightning at the Emperor, who nullified them before they touched him. The Emperor and Horus would engage one another in the throne room of the massive battle barge, a combat of both physical skill and psychic force in nature. The Emperor was unquestionably the most skilled and powerful warrior, but his love for his sons could not bring himself to bear his full strength against Horus, his first son. The Emperor would deflect multiple barrages with his lightning claw, but Horus was possessed, relentless, and sliced open the Emperor's chest armor. He right. then proceeded to sever the tendons in the right wrist, disarming the Emperor. 
an enraged psychic blast from the War Master seared the flesh from the Emperor's face, destroying one of his eyes, tearing the broken Emperor's right arm from his socket. Horus raised his father's broken ragdoll body high over his head to throw him down, breaking his body. The vicious and casual brutality of the Warpmaster's act galvanized the now broken Emperor as he awoke to what awaited mankind under the rule of Horus and the Chaos Gods. Realizing at last that his favored son was wholly lost to the corruption of Chaos, the He's Emperor gone. gathered his full psychic power, bringing it through his body and into the Immaterium, unleashing a lance of pure energy that pierced the gloating Horus's psychic defenses. The Emperor, in a white-hot rage, pierced his very being with psychic power. Before Horus died, the Chaos powers would abandon him. And as he looked his father in the eye, shedding a single tear, realizing his unforgivable betrayal, begging his father to forgive him. The Emperor saw regret in his know. fallen son's eyes, but the Emperor also knew that the Dark Gods could attempt Can't to possess Horus again, and that this time he would not be there to stop them if they did. Forcing all compassion from his mind for the sake of humanity, the Emperor tore his soul apart, not banishing or casting it to some dark realm, but erasing it from reality, destroying ah. Chaos utterly. His essence burned from existence in both the physical world and the Immaterium, so that Chaos could not resurrect Horus, their claim on his soul a bitter blow to the Dark Gods, who would scream a terrible psychic scream in their rage and frustration. The destruction of Horus' soul sent a psychic shockwave surging across the solar system, casting the demons of chaos back into the warp and spreading a mass panic among the traitor legions and other traitor forces on the surface of Terra who felt in fractions of seconds the weakening power and loss of the chaos mark upon them. It became clear to the traitors their what leader happened? had been defeated. In this moment, a terrible berserker fury, later to become known as the Black Rage, encompassed the Blood Angels. From the moment of their Primarch Sanguinis' death, they went out surging forth to scatter the attackers, slashing in all directions, howling vengeance upon them. The already retreating traitor legions ran for their lives, screaming in terror from the frenzied Blood Angels. They're still coming the for you. retreat soon turned to an apocalyptic bloodbath. Thousands upon thousands of Chaos Space Marines, as well as the Chaos Titans, fell, attempting to flee. Any who fell behind were obliterated by the Blood Angels. Many of them would be later found still wandering around in an insane rage, smashing the broken Chaos Space Marines to pieces with apparently little conscience, thought or control. The ground before the Imperial Palaces was now awash with blood of traitors and heretics. Meanwhile, the Imperial Fist's Primarch Rogal Dawn finally found his way to the corrupted Starship's bridge, only to discover his brother Sanguinius and the shattered and broken body of the Emperor, who was now, despite his near-immortal powers, on the very real verge of death. His remaining psychic energy spent in the defense of the Golden Throne and subsequent battle with Horus. The Emperor whispered instructions to Dawn, ordering him to transport him to the device known as the Golden Throne in the inner sanctum of the Imperial Palace. If there was any chance to save the Emperor's life, Dawn would of course do so, without question. Returning to the Golden Throne Room deep in the Imperial Palace, Dawn and the frail body of the Emperor arrived just as Malkador was beginning to fail. His body had been consumed by the immeasurably powerful psychic storms that were now visibly lashing his body. As the tech priests hastily adapted the throne to be able to support the Emperor, Malkador was disconnected. Within minutes of this though, his husk of a body would turn to dust, blowing across the stone floor. But not before he reached out with the very May last the of his life energy sacrifice. and transferred it to the Emperor, giving See, him that last injection of power needed to needed. survive for the moments until he could be transferred to the Golden Throne. This what a last guy. act of Malkador was another blessing from the Sigilite, as the Imperial attendants would come to the realization that they could do this many times over, and so began the almost endless task of locating and bringing Psychers to Holy Terror to have the honor of being sacrificed and transferred their energy to the Emperor to keep his spirit alive and also to keep the door of the raging Imperial Webway shut. This hey. last energy from Malkador would allow the Emperor to speak his final commands. 
to continue the fight to free humanity from the forces of chaos as well as the ignorance that continued to assail it. With these final words, he would be silent, his body now entombed within the mechanisms of the Golden Throne, his body shattered but his spirit remaining forever strong. He would command the Imperium through his psychic hints and emanations interpreted and carried out by the High Lords of Terror. Far from a broken shell, the Emperor would continue to support the Imperium, protecting them by shielding the webway, keeping the beacon of light, the Astronomicon used by Imperial navigators shining in the darkness, and some say the Emperor still now battles the forces of chaos on their own plane of existence, keeping the worst and most insidious demons from entering the material world or infecting the minds of suggestible men. Humanity had survived the darkest time, but at what cost? Hundreds of worlds stood destroyed or still now infected by the insanity of chaos. Half the Imperial forces had turned traitor and now began to retreat into the dark depths of the galaxy or the Eye of Terror itself. Many previously prosperous worlds were now considered unsavory and consequently Imperial fleets would arrive to perform exterminatus on these damned worlds, destroying all life on the planet and reducing it to an orbiting rock. The Imperium itself, despite the Emperor's best wishes, would struggle to maintain the sense of bright order once enjoyed during the Crusades. Now it would enter a difficult period, in many ways not too far removed from the 21st century where states of repression and ignorance were often widespread and caused many of the problems they would face. The Imperium operated on a new level of suppression of its citizens and in many ways it's hard to really find fault with this rationale. Given the severe blow to their military power, the Lords of Terror and remaining Primarchs needed to hold everything together amidst a crumbling empire. A still angry and battling traitor force who was still present throughout the galaxy and Imperial or systems, worse still was that the Xenos forces such as the Orc, Eldar and later Tyranids would seize on this opportunity to exploit humanity in its weakened state and would descend to ravage Imperial worlds that were unable to be successfully defended during this time. Yeah. Despite all this, the Imperium of Man would stand strong, and whilst far from the perfect empire the Emperor had sought to create, it would still represent humanity's best hope for survival. They were not cut off and isolated as they had been during the Age of Strife, and in some respects would regain much of their strength in the coming 10,000 years. Now at the end of the Horus Heresy, the Imperium of Man was far from what you would call secure, but it had taken back control of the offensive and the traitor legions. These were now fleeing with gathering haste from the territories of mankind. The primary source of strength for the Imperium now lay with the Ultramarines Legion. They were in a relatively unique position of having unintentionally suffered very little damage from the heresy, being ordered to a posting far from the activities of Horus and his traitor fleet. Arriving too late to have any real impact on the final battles of terror, Robert Gilliman found to his horror and frustration that the Emperor had already been wounded beyond repair and uncountable swathes of marines killed in defense oh. of the Imperial palaces. The Loyalist Legions has suffered immense casualties, be it on Isfahan, Terra, or any of the myriad engagements between, and that is to speak nothing of the appalling losses suffered by the millions of Imperial Guard and Mechanicum, in addition to the many worlds that were totally lost or also destroyed at this point. One saving grace for the Imperium was that the Ultramarines had been excluded from the campaign due to their significantly larger size than most other legions. Horus feared the Ultramarines especially as they were some of the most tactically able, the most uncorruptible and most importantly their overwhelming weight of numbers. Many legions in the time of the Crusade were recruited from the territories that they marshalled the Ultramarines, through sheer fortune, had gathered a force of somewhere in the region of 250,000 Space Marines, compared to a more average 100,000 of the other strongest legions in this period. Although size could vary from anything like 50 to 150,000, the size of a legion was determined often by external factors, and there were no strict rules about its limitations. It was more a case of the number of incoming new recruits, the inevitable battle losses, the availability of potential recruits, and the administrative skills of the Primarch and his officers. 
Gilliman was a great organiser and always pragmatic in his approach. Also, by coincidence, the system in which the Ultramarines were situated happened to have an especially plentiful supply of suitable new recruits who were excellent stock for genetic adaption into Astartes. The size of the Ultramarines was particularly important at this time, as the traitor legions had themselves suffered massive losses and were now without their primary leader, Horus. Disorganised, fearful and in some cases overcome with guilt and regret. This disorganisation enabled Gilliman to capitalise on the situation. Spreading his ultramarine force far and wide across the Imperium, enabling the other loyalist legions to consolidate their forces and in some cases restock from any new recruits who were already in the programme of conversion to full Astartes. They were speeded through their training. The traitors on the other hand had little opportunity for this, as the ultramarines would block any attempt they would make to try and secure supplies or new recruits for their damaged legions. Not to mention being continually harassed and assaulted Hunted, by the Black harassed. Guard Death Watch, fighting now with renewed vigour. Some sought supreme vengeance for, as they saw it, the destruction of their once proud legions, and moreover, the beloved Emperor himself. They wasted no time in immediately executing any corrupted traitors they found and would assist planets in crushing human cultists where they sprang forth. The newly established Inquisition at the command of the Emperor prior to his battle with Horus enabled the Imperium to have a fully established force to keep a watchful eye over any signs of taint of chaos with the same caution and paranoia that the Interrex civilization had approached it with many years during the negotiations of Horus and the Lunar Wolves. This Inquisition would later be supported by the Grey Knights. The Grey Knights are a highly secretive wing of the Imperial Space Marine forces dedicated to the sole task of locating and eliminating the taint of dark corruption and battling the Imperium's most lethal and foul enemies. This period now would become known as the Great Scouring and the Ultramarines along with the other recovering Loyalist Legions would carry out the Emperor's last passing words to the letter. Although many traitor marines fled in disarray, it became apparent in the years to come that some had established defensive bastions on distant worlds. It would take decades to cause enough damage to the legions of the Night Lords, the Alpha Legion and the Iron Warriors before they too would retreat to the abhorrent safety of the Eye of Terror. After this period of cleansing, the Imperium needed to take stock of its situation and plan for the future. This period would be referred to as the Reformation. The Dark Forces had for the most part been vanquished, but the problem facing the Loyalists now was how to proceed. A plan was required before they could attend the task at hand, namely rebuilding, expanding and protecting the Imperial Empire. Roboot had firmly taken a leading command in these matters, and it would be he who provided the blueprints for the Imperial Forces for the next 10 millennia. As Roboot saw it, the main cause of the heresy was less emotional than some of his brothers would have you believe. Mankind would always be unstable and this instability needed to be accounted for. Therefore, placing a legion of space marines in the hands of one man, no matter how godlike that man was, could inevitably lead to problems. The Warmaster had been able to command many legions, each comprising hundreds of thousands of superhuman warriors. Gilliman saw that this was a dangerous position to allow anyone other than the Emperor himself to hold, knowing the truth now that Primarchs were just as susceptible to persuasion as a mortal human. It would be irresponsible to allow the existing structure of the Astartes legions to continue. Gilliman would now separate the establishments of the Imperial military, creating and encouraging rivalries between them. In so doing, he hoped this would mean that they were less likely to be persuaded by one another should heresy occur again, and make it far more difficult for any one section to mobilise and carry out a significant campaign before it could be crushed. Prior to the end of the heresy, the Imperium had been overseen by the Council of Terror. These individuals managed the day-to-day -day running of the Imperium, but had been resented by the Primarchs for being mere mortals, as they were refused from partaking in these activities themselves. As the Emperor had instructed Malkador to find a new group of highly trusted, loyal and mentally strong individuals, some of these figures would now replace the Council of Terror to take their place as the High Lords of Terror. These figures would rule the Empire of Man for the many thousand of years to come. The High Lords would use the psychic whispers of the Emperor and interpret these to carry out his will and organise and manage the Imperium. 
The most significant change was also the most obvious. The Space Marine Legions had clearly caused the majority of the damage, and it was their immense size nice. that was the root of the problem. Snack it out. So Robert Gilliman would enact the second founding of the Space Marines. Seven years after the death of Horus and the final traitors had largely fled from the systems of the Imperium, the remaining Loyalist Legions would now be divided up from their hundreds of thousands of Marines into smaller 1,000 men strong chapters. The Legionis Astartes would now be known as the Adeptus Astartes. It was not a universally agreed plan though. Rogal Dawn and Lehman Russ would object strongly to their beloved legions being essentially disbanded. Yeah. But Khan and Korax of the White Scars and Raven Guard would side with Gilliman. The newly appointed High Lords of Terror also concurred with Gilliman that it was necessary to change to the system, and so this resolution would pass. Gilliman would also, in addition to these overall organizational changes, implement a new code of conduct for the Space Marines to follow. His fabled Codex what? Astartes. This laid out the rules and guidelines on proper organization, tactics, and order of battle for a Space Marine chapter. It also laid down strict rules to avoid the dangerous orders that came to pass during the heresy, such as the Divinian Lodge practice, which Horus enabled, and subsequently would lay the seeds of betrayal within the legions. Right. Needless to say, this is strictly illegal within the modern Astartes chapters. The Codex, for many other chapters of Marines, was a helpful guide on structure and practice, but for the Ultramarines, it represented the Gospel Word as laid down by their Primarch, and it would soon become a sacred tome for the Ultramarines, who would follow it as a strict and almost fanatical code by which they would live their lives, as would the many sibling chapters who were created from the vast wealth of manpower that the Ultramarines and their superior gene seed would provide. Superior! Despite Gilman's pride in his codex, some chapters like the Blood Angels, Dark Angels and Space Wolves adopted the codex's guidelines only in part as a sign of their continuing disagreement with the choices being made. And additionally, perhaps the fact that Gilman was allowed to dictate the future structure of the Astartes when he had played very little actual role in the defense of terror during the heresy. Putting their grievances aside though, it was clear to any looking in objectively that no other Primarch than Gilliman was better suited to this task than he. The Emperor's vision of a human civilization free from superstitious cults and irrational plans was far from successful. For all the amazing achievements of the Emperor, he would be ultimately defeated not by a supremely powerful alien race or a godlike demon from the warp, instead he was defeated by the simple fact that mankind was fundamentally flawed and how tragic that despite the Emperor having learned so much from his thousands of years observing humanity, this was not enough to prevent it retracing its fatal errors time and time again. The age of the Imperium is now one of bureaucracy, of tyrants and unreason, an era of slow growth and repression. Humanity has frustratingly regressed back into religious beliefs while the Emperor sits immobile unable to guide and enact his true will. His thoughts we can only glimpse at and are largely unknown. The immortal super being whose remaining psychic power still extends over a million worlds is now a ruined husk. His mortal body to all definitions destroyed. Although the Imperium had succeeded in preventing total annihilation from the forces of Horus and the Warp and Chaos, the cost of that conflict was unquantifiable. The ultimate loss was not that of life or territory, but the failure to establish the secular and stable empire the Emperor had hoped to create. The Age of the Imperium of Man, Chapter 10 The Horus Heresy was ended. Primarch Gilliman and Good. the Ultramarines had Thank secured God. the territories of the Imperium of Man and the remaining Imperial forces had consolidated and restructured for the future and the security of the Empire. The age of the Imperium of Man would now begin at the end of the 31st millennium. The light and hope of the glorious Crusade era was now gone forever. Without the Emperor to lead humanity directly, the immeasurable threats to the galaxy presented to human life led the High Lords of Terror to create an Imperial administration that was increasingly authoritarian highly bureaucratic and generally dismissive and uncaring towards individual human lives as long as its structure and authority was maintained. Okay. Religion also would begin mm. to resurge as an important tool of social control. 
the Emperor's preferred original rationalist truth the was sidelined by the growing imperial cult. Believing, as once the word bearers legion had, that the Emperor was a divine being and the saviour of mankind. Only the latter would be an accurate statement. Yeah. For many people, this point in time would be the end of our story. But there's more. Despite things seeming more stable now, Wait. this would not last. An extreme and horrific attack would now come barely 500 years after the inception of the High Lords of Terror by the Officio Assassinorum. This was the highly secretive and lethal assassin's wing of the Imperial forces. On the orders of the Grand Master of Assassins, the High Lords were slain to a single man. The Retribution Force of Space Marines was dispatched to the Assassin's Temple, and despite suffering near total casualties, they were able to complete their objective and kill the Grand Master of the Assassin's Order. The Imperium would now descend into near anarchy for a period of years while a new High Council was screened and established. Another small aside now on the fates of the remaining Primarchs. This is one issue that is hugely frustrating, that despite the survival of many of the Primarchs through the darkest of times, many would now disappear or die, and in the overall perspective of things, often barely befitting their weight and importance. This is one bone of contention I have with the lore, as to me it seems these unique characters were essentially just written out of history as a matter of convenience. It's very frustrating. To satisfy your curiosity though, Rogal Dawn of the Imperial Fists would die in the last 31st millennium fighting to defend against the first Black Crusade. These were crusades launched from the Eye of Terror by the Traitor Legions into the Imperium. Robert Gilliman would be fatally wounded during the Battle of Thessala in 121 millennium 31, when he encountered one of the traitor Primarchs Fulgrim of the Emperor's Children, who had risen to become a demon prince of Slaanesh. Fulgrim cut Gilman's neck with a poisonous sword that some say resembled an anatheme sword which was used to wound Horus on the moon of Davin at the inception of the Horus heresy. Vulcan of the Salamanders disappeared. He was seemingly disillusioned and broken after his legion's devastating losses during the heresy. He vowed to return in the end times. However, he would appear some 1500 years later where he would defend the Imperial world Caldera against an orc invasion. He would then return to Holy Terror and berate the High Lords of Terror for their petty squabblings. Vulcan would restate his return was only temporary and he was destined to appear in another time. He would later be recorded as killed battling an orc warboss. The Salamanders though still hunt for him, believing he will return to them should they acquire the nine artifacts of Vulcan. Jagate Khan of the White Scars disappeared through a dark Eldar warp portal whilst he was pursuing those savage Xenos after a raid on the White Scars homeworld. Rumours that he was captured whilst lost in the twisting paths of the Dark Eldar section of the webway. Lionel Johnson of the Dark Angels returned to his homeworld of Caliban to find it in ruins and some of his marines tainted by chaos. Whilst battling them, the Dark Chaos Gods unleashed a massive warp storm upon the planet, consuming the majority of structures save the Dark Angel's own fortress. But when the storms abated, the lion was nowhere to be found. The Dark Angels hold amongst their number many rumours about where he is and how he'll one day return to them. Korax of the Raven Guard wanted to repopulate his legion after the Isvan V massacre. He sought to accelerate the growth of his legion by obtaining a sample of the pure Primarch DNA from Terra that the Emperor had used to create his sons. The Emperor psychically implanted the memory of the ancient laboratory in his mind to allow Korax to carry out this mission, and the needed genetic material was obtained. Now though, infiltrators within the Raven Guard from the chaos-tainted Alpha Legion used a demonic essence to corrupt this pure Primarch DNA sample, causing many newly created Raven Guard to become distorted abhorrent mutants. Korax would become so ashamed, guilt-stricken and disillusioned with himself that he isolated himself away for a whole year, begging the Emperor's spirit for forgiveness, before he would ultimately fly alone straight into the Eye of Terror to wreak revenge on the traitors. Lehman Russ of the Space Wolves is one of the Primarchs whose disappearance appears to be voluntary. The Space Wolves hold a legend that says Russ went on a quest to find a means to cure the Emperor with the fruit from the mystical Tree of Life. 
but the truth is likely to be far more complex. Others have said that Ross travelled into the Eye of Terror to lead his lost 13th company against Magnus the Red and the Thousand Sons Traitor Legion. Still, other legends hold that Ross was dying and that he shall return to when the Imperium most needs him, the period called the Wolf Time, to lead the Wolves of Fenris once more. With the Primarchs gone, the Chapter Masters would take command and the High Lords of Terror would truly become now the rulers of the Imperium. Thankfully though, this poor and horrific start to the Imperium would now be replaced by three millennia of strength and stability from the period of M32 to M35. The Imperium was able to re-establish roots with most of its major colonies, as well as securing and bringing into the Imperium many new colonies not reached during the Crusades, who proved to be immeasurably valuable. As an added bonus, Imperial forces were able to secure an incredibly rare and well-preserved STC from the Dark Age of Technology, which further boosted the development of new technology. Very nice. This also served to demonstrate to the Mechanicum of Mars that the Imperium was still a worthwhile ally and deserving of their continued partnership without even the Emperor. Despite the carnage and appalling threats occurring in the universe, a great many worlds within the Imperium see none of this in their lifetime, and some worlds have the good fortune to actually live in relative peace. In fact, many Imperial systems actually have very little interaction with the structure or forces of the Imperium. To many citizens, the prospect of actually seeing a fabled space marine of the Imperium, these semi-godlike figures, is a lifelong dream and one that very few people actually get to experience. I don't know if it's the a good thing or a bad thing. are not posted to all planets, there are simply just too few of them now for this to be feasible. Instead, they maintain a presence on the most threatened or precarious of systems, defending the Imperium against the worst Xenos concentrations or assisting the Inquisition to seek out and destroy any signs of corruption. They also continue the search for the STCs, the Holy Grails of the Imperium, relics of immeasurable value. The safety of the Imperium is maintained through fact-finding missions and reports from psychers across light years of space. The Adeptus Administratum maintain a highest level of information possible so that all Imperial forces can focus their diminished resources on the most likely locations at risk. Frustratingly though, and almost unbelievably, the Imperium would now sanction religion as many Imperial cults had risen, dedicating to the worship of the Emperor as the God of Mankind. The majority of these would become unified into a centralised religious body known as the Ecclesiarchy. This powerful church gained momentum until the 32nd millennium where it became the official state religion of the Imperium and the title of Adeptus Ministorum. Centuries later, Ecclesiarch Venerus II receives a seat amongst the High Lords of Terror, and after 300 standard years, the seat reserved for the Ecclesiarch is made a permanent addition to the ranks of the High Lords of Terror. Given that the Lords are meant to infer the Emperor's psychic whispers and wishes, these actions make you question how little they are actually able to communicate with the Emperor, or perhaps how much they choose to ignore given the fact that the Emperor flew into a near rage when he discovered the actions of the word bearers during the Great Crusade. Should the Emperor ever return to the Imperium reincarnated, he which is mad. entirely feasible, those pledged to any Imperial religion or who took a hand in its establishment would be wise to expect a harsh judgement from the Emperor, who despised all forms of religion and saw them as nothing but a problem for the advancement of humanity. The Imperium of Man would stand until its current date of the 41st millennium, and despite its often counterproductive bureaucracy, it continues to function and maintain a strong fighting force within the galaxy. Member worlds generally govern themselves as long as they recognise the authority of the Emperor and his appropriate civil servants and support the state religion, the Imperial cult, which places the Emperor as the divine being, the true god of mankind. Every world of the Imperium pays also the Imperial taxes levied on them, but not in monetary form, they pay in men and materials known as the Imperial Tithe. The Imperial Tithe supports the overall economy of the Imperium by redistributing resources where needed, supporting one region by drawing resources from more peaceful sectors. The Imperium promotes the development of a neo-feudal political system, which the High Lords of Terror and the Inquisition have decided to be the most stable form of human government. This essentially means that a ruling class or powerful family oversee the needs of the planet. 
This intense need for political stability and the growing military demands upon the imperial system have created a repressive state, and the belief in the divine emperor has only reduced scientific progress to a minimum. Ancient technology from the unification wars and crusades or even the dark age of technology are merely maintained and are rarely pushed forward. This stagnation has led to many to describe this period leading on from the dawn of the 40th millennium as the time of ending for mankind. It must be said though that with the admittedly often repressive and regularly harsh regime of the Imperium, the protection it provides, mankind as a whole would have been consumed by the seemingly endless dangers that threaten it. Without the Emperor, there would be no Imperium of Man, and without the Imperium and mankind's faith in the Emperor, the human race would have surely become extinct long a ago. Long time ago. Still, despite all of this, you could in many ways argue that even with all the flaws and failings, the Emperor had achieved most of the goals he had set in order to make mankind a stable and powerful force within the galaxy. Or yeah, did he? Sorta. At first glance, the forging of the Imperium of Man and the Imperial Truth during the Great Crusade seems to be a great contradiction. If the Emperor, who had lived for many thousands of years and who, due to his own extreme psychic power, knew intimately the realm of the warp and the creatures therein, why would he propagate a system designed to only support rationalism and science? It seems feasible to speculate that the Emperor had plans that reached far beyond the Crusades and the creation of the Imperium, and that these had barely even begun to pass. Scratch the surface. In that sense, the Imperium and the Legionis Astartes was a catastrophic failure. We can speculate that the Emperor's overall goal was the total destruction of the Chaos Gods and those dark forces that would threaten mankind. Could be. The Emperor had fair reason to turn humanity to a secular society, having witnessed many times over the will of men transforming a faith based on the tenets of loving your fellow man and respect for one another into bloody creeds of appalling violence, repression, murder and wholesale genocide. These actions, yeah. as with the Eldar, would actually strengthen the Chaos Gods. So the Emperor perceived that religion and faith was something that had no benefit in his current aspirations. In a sense, he was correct when you look at the facts on paper and also when you consider the Word Bearers Legion and how it would take them significantly longer than any other Astartes Legion when converting the worlds they found to the divine cult of the Emperor. The Emperor had decided that during the Age of Strife, it was time for him to come to the fore and take control of the situation. He feared that unless all of mankind was united, it would eventually be consumed by the nightmares facing the galaxy, including Chaos and other Xenos races. By enforcing the Imperial Truth on every colony of humanity in the galaxy, the Emperor had hoped to forge a belief in rational thinking and science so strong that the warp creatures of Chaos who lived off the dark energy and negative emotions of humanity would become permanently weakened to the point that they might even dissolve from the warp. The only problem with this plan would be that the dark forces were far from weak when the Emperor brought his plan to its inception. They were at the height of their power, power, feasting off the perverse fall of the Eldar Empire. So from the beginning, Chaos sought to destroy his plans, or at the very least significantly disrupt them. Ultimately, as it would play out, they would be successful to this end. When looking at this period as a whole, it would be fair conclusion to say that the Emperor deeply underestimated humanity's basic need for at least a proportion of society to believe in something larger than itself, beyond the sterile confines of science and technology. In many ways, the grim comedy of the whole affair is that the Emperor rigidly maintained that he should never be worshipped as a divine being, but and as just a man, albeit an unbelievably powerful man. His questionable judgement in laying the foundations of the Imperium and later the Crusades proved his own proclamations that he was indeed just a man, capable of miscalculations as any mortal human. Yet despite this, he still would end up becoming worshipped as a divine being. You could call the whole series of events a tragedy, especially in the sense that legions of religious worshippers and pilgrims of the Imperium could never understand the irony of worshipping a man who had, over the course of millennia, done everything in his power to extinguish religion from the human race. To rub salt into the wound though, it is especially contentious that the binding factor in holding the Imperium together after the heresy was in part of course the Ultramarines, but also, significantly, religious faith in the Emperor himself. Yep. Added to this though, humanity's religious faith in the godlike Emperor would actually empower his psychic form in the warp and enable him to combat chaos 
on their own plane as well as continuing to guide and protect humanity in the material world through the Astronomicon and his ever guiding light. Nice. Which all seems ultimately ironic that for all of the Emperor's efforts to destroy organized religion it would ultimately become his saving grace. Though the price for the survival of the Imperium and humanity had been at a level beyond comprehension and a cost far greater than the Emperor hoped humanity would have had to bear, a new version of the Imperial Truth had become predominant among the million worlds of mankind. A truth that lies at the heart of the Imperial Creed. A simple truth that strengthens all from the weakest human citizen to the most powerful superhuman Astartes. The Emperor protects. Alrighty guys, well that was Luno 9, The Emperor of Man Part 2. And man, I'll tell you what guys, that, that definitely answered a lot of questions that I was having, especially about this whole whole universe. But man, the 31st millennium, uh, that did not sound like a good time. I mean, poor Horus to be uh, basically converted over to chaos, and then him to take nine other uh, space marine chapters, legions. And basically uh, convert them, wipe out, wipe out all the loyalists, loyalists uh, to the emperor. Man, that that took some uh, planning, some skill. And then I, I always wondered why the emperor looked like a skeleton, but for Horus to um, slice him up his chest, cut off his arm, blast his face, make him look like a skeleton. Man, guys. Man, the 31st millennium. Yeah, wasn't a good time. Wasn't a good time at all. And then, honestly, for the Emperor to basically want to be wiping out religion as a whole, just pursuing science, and then him ultimately becoming, becoming a religion himself, I guess. I mean, everybody worships him. And I mean, in turn, that does make him stronger in the warp. So he can fight in the warp as well as the in the materium. Very interesting. Man, guys. Ugh. That was a lot. That was a lot. Luton does a really good job of explaining this stuff, but I feel like there are still parts that I didn't absorb as well. Ugh. Like I now I understand some of the jokes the Emperor's uh, Texas speech device was talking about. You're like, where where did you guys come from? Like you weren't here last time. You weren't here when I was uh when I was here. Interesting. But guys, that is gonna be the end of the video for today. I hope you enjoyed it. That was a long one. But guys, if you enjoy what we're doing, go ahead and go down that like and subscribe button. Beat beat that crap up. Let's get up to two thousand so we can give uh give away this lightsaber. Hide him back here somewhere. Down there. Uh, like I said, guys, once we hit 2,000 or we finish the Star Wars vs. Warhammer series, um, we're going to be giving that bad boy away. So keep keep an eye out for that. And always, guys, y'all have a great rest of your night. Peace, love, happiness to you. And always, guys, be easy. Love you guys.